So, after the drama of poison gas in Salisbury, we now have the, uh, the runner-up, poison gas in Syria. Surprise, surprise. For the period of the last week, we have been constantly bombarded with all kinds of horror stories and uh, atrocity uh, pictures, mainly of young children uh, apparently suffering from, uh, from something anyway not quite sure what, and being doused with water by uh, the white helmets. Yes, the same white helmets that always seem to be on hand, if not necessarily with uh, first aid kits, certainly with up-to-date uh, and efficient cameras to photograph the latest uh, imagined or real atrocity. Of course, there have been many atrocities in uh, Syria conducted by both sides, or by all sides, I should say, in this particularly vicious and bloody civil war. But you see, there's a problem here, isn't there? We've seen these pictures before. In fact, they're, they're so alike that some uh, people have argued that they are in fact the same pictures that, that were shown to us last time. But when, when was it? 12, month, 12 months ago, under very similar circumstances. But see, my, my first observation is this, before we come to the Security Council, the rows, the accusations on both sides, the denials, the heated exchanges and so on, we should ask us a, a, a few pertinent questions here. Now my first observation is this, the region concerned, East uh, Gota, which is like a suburb of, uh, of Damascus, where there's been a particularly sharp conflict raging for some time now, has in fact fallen to the troops of the Syrian government. The uh, so-called Syrian rebels, that's what they're called, or even better, Syrian activists, you see. This is the type of parlance which is used. Let's call a spade a shovel. The jihadis, yes, the jihadi terrorists, which have occupied this area and other parts of Syria for some time now, have been defeated. Oh yes, yes, they have surrendered. In fact, there was a deal. And there is a deal between these so-called rebels, these jihadis, and the Syrian government that they should vacate the area, they should abandon it. There have been films on the television, it's been, it's been shown on, on television news, of whole convoys of these so-called rebels, of these jihadis, leaving uh, East Ghouta for Idlib. They've been allowed to leave on condition that they, they don't leave booby traps and don't leave mines and so on and so forth. On, on these strict conditions, they're allowed to, to leave by the Syrian government. The, insofar as there's any resistance left, it's a tiny pocket where I think one of the jihadi groups has perhaps object, objected to this deal. There's so many of these creatures that one, one loses count. But uh, take it from me that this area is lost. Oh, and incidentally, with the loss of this area, and this is what particularly annoys the Americans in particular, the CIA in the first instance, is that after the fall of East Gotha, the civil war in Syria is in effect ended. Bashar al-Assad in effect now controls all that matters in Syria, it's under his control now. He's never been stronger, even the, his enemies are obliged to admit, so very reluctantly to admit this, this uh, regrettable fact. Assad now controls, he's in complete control of all the major towns and cities of Syria. The rebels, if you want to call them that, in reality the jihadi uh, monsters, I would call them, have suffered a severe defeat. And isn't it strange, isn't it, 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 doesn't it beg a belief that precisely at this moment, when Assad has just scored a stunning victory, when he's in control of over 90% of the territory concerned, precisely at this moment, the rebels, the, the government rather, should launch a poison gas attack. It, it doesn't make sense, my friends. It simply does not make sense. What possible motive could Assad have had to perform such a madness as that? It does, they don't need these chemical weapons, by the way. They don't need them at all. They're quite efficient with their tanks and their bombs and their missiles uh, and their machine guns. Quite sufficient to deal with the rebels, as has been demonstrated. Therefore, point number one, Assad had no motive 
for performing this act of madness, if that's what it would be if it were, if it, if it, if it were to be established as a fact. And he had no need, no, no need to do it. They, they had already defeated the, the rebels. Therefore, it's similar to Salisbury in that sense. What motive has Putin had to use poison gas in, uh, in, in Salisbury? One asks whether the, the two things are not in fact linked. Certainly the reaction of the West is uh, identical, isn't it? With what indecent haste Donald Trump came out immediately and said, oh, the, it's the Syrians and it's the Russians and it's the Iranians responsible for this. No investigation, no evidence, none whatsoever. The Russians, of course, and the Syrians have denied it. Point blank. They say that there's no proof of the existence of any poison gas, chlorine or anything else in this area. And they've even, please take note, they've, they've offered today to offer to open up this area to anyone that cares to go in there to investigate and find on the ground to find the facts of the case. But of course, the Americans are not interested, nor are the French, nor is our beloved Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. May, not remotely interested in establishing the, the facts of the case, as they're not remotely interested in the facts of the case pertaining to the Stripal uh, attempted assassination. No, no, no. Their judge and jury and execution are all rolled into one. And Trump has, has, has already announced that his intention to take his revenge in some kind of military action. Now, what kind of military action are we talking about here? Action to defeat the Syrian government? Action to put the clock back? Action to over, 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 overthrow Assad? Well, no such thing. There is, my friend, not a slow boss chance in hell of the Americans or the French or the British putting ground troops into Syria, and that's the only thing which can count, or overthrowing Assad or defeating him in, in, on, the, on, on, the, on the ground of military action. The only kind of action which, which therefore would be uh, considered by the Americans is clearly some kind of an aerial bombardment or more, more likely a missile strike, as last time. Exactly the same scenario. The rebels were being defeated, they were hammered into the ground. Suddenly there's these pictures of alleged gas attacks. And then of course there's the Tomahawk missile attack. Against what? To the best of my knowledge, against an empty airfield, which subsequently was very quickly rebuilt. And the actual results of this so-called decisive intervention by the Americans, zero. Absolutely zero. It will be the same this time. No matter what the Americans do to huff and puff and threaten to blow the house down, well, of course, they will do no such thing. They're very good, the Americans, at denouncing the Russians and the Syrians and the Iranians for atrocities, forgetting their own atrocities, of course, very conveniently. They're not quite so good at actual, actually following up words with deeds. As for Mr. Macron, well, he's got his own problems, hasn't he? There's a, if, if you hadn't noticed, there's a mass wave of, of strikes and demonstrations taking place on the streets of France as I speak, which quite easily might end up in a general strike. It could even end up in another May 68, as the brutal attacks on the students and so on. And Macron, of course, now is in difficulties. What does one do when one is in difficulties? Well, one calls up airstrikes, one rings up uh, Donald Trump and so on and so forth. This, these are diversionary tactics, same as our dear Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. May, diversionary tactics, same as Donald Trump, who's got his own share of problems, as you probably have realized. If you watch the news, the investigation is getting closer, the fire is under his backside. Therefore, what does he do? Well, he, he, he breathes fire and brimstone against the Russians in order to establish his anti-Russian credentials, naturally. The problem in relation, of course, to Mrs. May, she's got a particular problem, inasmuch as the last time they tried a stunt like this under uh, David Cameron, they were defeated in the vote of the House of Commons. Now, uh, Mrs. May uh, cannot afford to be defeated in the House of Commons. Not so sure whether she would or would not be defeated. It partly de depends on the behaviour of the Labour fifth column, these Tory agents on the Labour uh, benches. Depends on, on, whether, uh, on, on whether they get a free vote or not. I don't know. I don't know what Jeremy Corbyn will do in this case. Either way, I believe it's irrelevant. Because long before the, the British will have the opportunity to express a democratic vote in the mother of all parliaments, uh, Mr. Trump undoubtedly will have re released his uh, rockets 
against some target or other in in, in Syria. He uh, might have done it already as I'm speaking. Uh, certainly by the time you've seen this uh, video, the, the deed will be done. But what's the result of this, as I say? You see, it, it, it has escaped people's notice that in the last week there was a conference taking place involving three countries, pertaining to Syria that is. The three countries concerned were Russia, uh, Turkey and Iran. Yes, as I have stated, Russia, Turkey and Iran. The Americans, of course, the British and the French, frozen out entirely. And that little detail, by the way, which is precisely what's going to settle the, uh, the business in Syria, reflects the real position. The United States nowadays counts for nothing in, uh, in Syria. They've also been defeated, along with the Saudis and the other gangsters. They've suffered a military defeat at the hands not so much of Assad, but at the hands certainly of Russia and Iran. And they don't like this. They don't like it one little bit. The CIA, in cahoots with the Saudis, they've got excellent relationships. They don't want to end this uh, terrible conflict in Syria. They want to keep it going. They want to keep stoking the flames. And above all, they want to prevent any possibility of a deal or an understanding between Donald Trump and the Russians. That, I think, really puts it in, in, in context. It puts it in a nutshell. Oh, of course, I've forgotten the Israelis. The Israelis beat them to it, didn't they, with this air strike, undeclared airstrike, uh, which Netany Netanyahu's launched against a, a target in Syria for his own purposes. You see, Mr. Netanyahu also has been uh, in serious difficulty. He's uh, under accusations for all kinds of irregularities, for corruption and the rest of it. And therefore, he also feels the same need, the self-same policy, of dis detracting attention from his problems at home by a military adventure abroad. A very pretty picture, isn't it? The only trouble is that, of course, the people at the, at the receiving end, the people who will suffer as a result of this, is, of course, the long-suffering people of Syria, who no doubt are sick of this war when it end of it. If it's not ended, it's not because they couldn't end it, <clears throat> it's because powerful foreign interests are at stake to keep the, f the, the fire going, to keep the conflict going in their own cynical interests. And the biggest cynics of all, the biggest hypocrites of all, of course, are the ones in Washington, Paris and London. That, my friends, is the real conclusion one has to draw from this terrible, ghastly humanitarian disaster that is Syria.